Good afternoon, everyone. While the people on this screen are dispersed around Victoria, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we each live and work. I am speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to any First Nations people who may be joining us today. Sovereignty has never been ceded. I am Ruth Gormley. My preferred pronouns are she and her, and I lead the strategic marketing team at Creative Victoria. I'm very proud of our partnership with Arts Hub that brings these roadmap, recovery roadmap webinars to you. Melbourne is emerging, blinking, from our long lockdown. Regional Victoria and New South Wales have also recently seen the end of prolonged lockdowns and restrictions, and Australia is still largely locked off from the rest of the world. We are thrilled to see these incoming changes, but it is change, and it's change that's followed on from an extended period of uncertainty and fear, and that can be tricky to navigate, which is why we have Greta Bradman here today to talk to us about maintaining mental health as we emerge from lockdown. Greta Bradman is a psychologist, performing artist, broadcaster, and sector leader. She consults on organisational culture, mental health and wellbeing strategy, implementation and evaluation. And we are delighted that she has made time in her very full diary to join us for this webinar. Today, Greta will share some practical advice and strategies that you can use to support your transition and adjustment as restrictions ease. We hope you find the strategies useful as we navigate our way into COVID normal. On the housekeeping front, this webinar is being live captioned. If you'd like to access the captioning, just select show title from your Zoom menu. We're also recording this session, so any questions you ask will be on record. The recorded webinar will be available through the Creative Exchange page on the Creative Victoria website and on Arts Hub. We'll send out a survey following the webinar, so please fill that in and let us know how we've gone and what you'd like to see in future. I'll now pass over to Richard Watts from Arts Hub, who will be speaking with Greta today. Richard. Ruth, thank you very much. Uh, my camera is playing up, but up oh, there we go. We've actually got it working this time. So again, Ruth, thank you. And indeed, thank you to all of your team at Creative Victoria for helping us uh, facilitate and produce these webinars. My name is Richard Watts. I'm the Performing Arts Editor at Arts Hub, uh, and I'm speaking with you today uh, from Woiwurrung Country. Uh, our latest recovery roadmap webinar is Maintaining Mental Health as We Emerge from Lockdown, uh, a series of webinars, uh, previous episodes of which you can find on Arts Hub uh, that are co-presented by Arts Hub and Creative Victoria. Ruth has already mentioned our very special guest today, Greta Bradman, uh, and Given that Greta's clinical practice foci include uh, values-based decision-making, performance in the arts and business, and anxiety, I think she's uh, very well suited to speak to our topic today. Greta joins us from Boonwurrung country, uh, and I know, speaking personally, I myself have experienced some degree of anxiety as we emerge from lockdown, as, and as I have to remind myself of the skills that I may have lost around socialising and being with people. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to Greta's presentation, which will run for between 10 and 15 minutes, after which we'll be taking questions from you. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask those questions. And remember that you can upvote one another's questions, which will help us ensure that we're discussing the topics that are most important to you. Uh, if you'd like to share any of the conversation on social media today, please use the hashtag recovery roadmap webinars. And I'd now like to introduce Greta and throw things over to her. Uh, and I look forward to her presentation and to taking your questions afterwards. Thanks, Richard, and hello. As, uh, as Richard mentioned, I'm on Bunwaring country today, and I'd like to add my respect to the elders past and present of this country and extend that to First Nations peoples from around Australia or elsewhere who are on this uh, Zoom chat today. So there are so many directions that we could take this conversation today, and I really want to be guided by you. So. I figure I'm going to talk for a little while about some things that might seem broad, uh, but hopefully you'll find value in them as the months ahead unfold. And then we can get into it with your questions. 
Um, and uh, as Richard said, I suppose my practice has encompassed some areas that might be of interest to you, but um, do feel free just to you know, ask what you think might be helpful to you, to your colleagues, to others around you. And I thought that we might have uh, a bit of an experiential moment in there as well. Um, and by experiential moment, I'm going to take you on a, a little bit of an adventure into your mind for a, uh, a few minutes. So you might have heard that, uh, you know, we who work in the creative industries experience disproportionately high rates of sleep dysfunction, greater lifetime mental illness and higher levels of depression and anxiety symptoms too than the general Australian population. And that was before COVID. Um, and there's a bunch that I could say about this if you're interested, but for now, suffice to say as a group, we, we didn't start out that way. We tend to start out as highly empathetic, curious, courageous and resilient uh, individuals, sufficient enough to embark on a career in the creative industries. And in fact, at a population level, research would suggest that in the early years of performing arts study at a tertiary, uh, tertiary level, so post school level, our mental health and well-being tends to start out better than the general population. So that's not to say that it's all sunshine and roses at that stage. And um, we can certainly feel things very deeply, but uh, at a population level, on average, our mental health and well-being is better than the general population than the general population. Um, but then when we start embarking on work within the industry, uh, and this can this can actually start when we're still in tertiary studies, the sort of the latter half of tertiary studies, that's where things start to change. So the more that we are. Uh, I guess it happens at a time where we aspire to rely on our creativity for a living. The more time we spend, spend cultivating our craft and getting most of our reinforcement even for who we are, primarily from our time in the performing arts, for instance, the more we're at risk of industry-related factors impacting on our mental health. And the interesting thing is, the World, definition, the World Health Organization's definition of mental health doesn't mental, mention mental ill health, and it puts us all in the same boat, whether we're in the creative industries or elsewhere. And that is a boat where we're really influenced by where we are and what we do and the alignment of those elements with who we are. So you might be familiar with the definition, but I, I wrote it down on a card, which is actually hilarious because I, I, I doodle on my cards. But, um, the, the WHO definition is a state of mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual realises their own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and is able to make a contribution to their community. So I think this totally fits with the realisations many are having at the moment and have had through the last year and by many, I mean many within the Australian community more generally. And that's that mental health, just like physical health is something to cultivate. It's something deeply embedded in our context and our environment. And it's relevant to each and every one of us. And we see in this WHO definition that mental health is a state of wellbeing rather than something fixed in which we realize our own abilities. So it speaks of our ability to align our efforts with our strengths. It speaks of coping with the normal stresses of life. So we cultivate a baseline capacity to cope and respond to stressful events when they occur. And the definition also speaks of working productively, which touches on the link between mental health and well-being and performance, and that we're able to make a contribution to our community. So it acknowledges the, the common human tendency to strive to contribute in some way. And I would go so far as to say that's really, really strong in the creative industries and in the performing arts. So mental health is about making progress towards thriving, not just surviving, so we can contribute and live well. And that's a really important goal to really hold on to at the moment when a lot of people are doing it tough. Alongside that, uncomfortable and painful emotions are inevitable and part of the human experience. But I wanna be super clear in saying that where they are there more often than not, please seek professional support. And if that support isn't helpful the first time, then try again, because it's not you, it's the help 
and it's just the alignment between the two. You can, for instance, find a really great psychologist, but who doesn't work for you. And that's fine. It's unfortunate because, you know, you've just spent time and money um, seeing one person, but don't give up because truly the help is out there when you need it. Just sometimes it's, it, it takes a little bit to, to find. Um, and we can talk more about that if you're interested. But, you know, the, the patterns and habits of our thoughts and our relationship our relationships with our thoughts, they're kind of, I think of them like well-worn sheep tracks. You know how if you go in, out into the country and you might see sheep tracks meandering through paddocks and the sheeps tend to follow those sheep, sheep tend to follow those tracks again and again, and so they become more and more worn. It's kind of like some of our thoughts. So they can really impact on how you feel and what you're able to do in the world. And they can be bloody difficult, if not impossible, to shift without professional support. And whether or not you feel that you're worth it, you are worth it. And you are deserving of thriving and not just surviving in your life. So I want to talk about something that I'm hearing a lot of people really getting into at the moment, and that is shoulds. So I, this is something that I, I want um, to reflect on. These two words, these two extraordinary words that can have such an impact on how we feel. They can underpin a decline of self-confidence, of feeling enough, feeling fit enough, smart enough, likable enough, um, fast enough capable enough with our instrument, if we play an instrument or our tech, if we're a tech person, whatever it is. So these two words, I should, they can hold you back from embracing vulnerability in ways that might allow the real you to shine through so that you feel seen in a good way for who you are. These two words might even be, I should be feeling worse about this situation, or I should be feeling not so uncomfortable in myself. I have it so much better than this person down the road. Well, that might be true. Um, may, maybe that is, but whether or not it is true, and we're gonna get into this, how helpful is that should for you? So these words, I should, they can capitalize on the currency of shame. So they can shame you into getting stuff done. They can shame you into thinking about how you want to live your career and move forward. But shame can also lead to a path that diverges from what is really meaningful to you. So if you have an inkling um, of, of what this looks like for you, maybe an I should for you, maybe even one that isn't too private, think about if you'd, um, if you'd like to put any of your shoulds in the chat. So it might even be something like I should have a clean house or I should be practicing more or I should work harder or I should be fitter. I should be more social now that lockdown is, is coming out or I should be trying harder. I should be dressing better. I shouldn't care so much about what others think of me. Shouldn't are still shoulds after all. And you might be thinking that some of these shoulds are really legitimate and helpful, maybe even necessary. And okay, yes, this is, this is where I, I suppose semantics come in but really important semantics because at the end of the day, I should, they're two really important words and there's an opportunity in these two words. So I want you to picture an I should that is something that really needs doing for you. I should eat lunch. I should finish that work project, which is expected of me. What about this sort? They're productive, they're helpful, they're necessary. These are in line with looking after yourself in, in the short term, like with lunch or in the longer term with finishing a work project and progressing your career. So this is what I call the bucket challenge. Create three buckets. One is the essential bucket and you're going to call it, I need. So I want you to think about things that might go in this bucket that maybe you were thinking about as shoulds, but now you're going, oh, actually, so I should, I guess, take um, my 17 week old puppy Clara for a walk in the morning or she'll literally start tearing the house apart. Okay, so that's not, I'm gonna move that from my should bucket and I'm going to put it in my need bucket. Another one is I should prepare for my ABC Classic radio show on, on the weekend, 
um, well, no, I, I need and even I want to prepare for my ABC Classic radio show so that it runs smoothly, so that there's a program to present and so forth. So that's not a should either. That's actually something that I intentionally uh, want to do and I intend to action. So if, you, uh, if you're sort of getting an inkling, I'd like you to think about which of the shoulds could you relabel I need I need to make dinner for my family because my kids are growing and hungry and I care for their well-being. Which ones can you label, relabel I want? I want to go for a run because it makes me feel better in myself and I value my health. And which ones are left in the I should bucket? Now, don't get me wrong. Some shoulds like, for instance, uh, I should think about eating better than I have through COVID, or I should think about maybe cutting down on the wine intake now that lockdown's over. Okay, so that's gonna stay in my should bucket, but it's because at the moment I'm just intending to leave it, my food and my um, wine intake as they have been actually, they're, they're not so bad really, but, um, but at some point I might want to shift them over into an I, I want or I need, but at the moment they're staying in the should bucket. And you know what that means? It means that I accept that these will not be actioned at present and I am not going to pretend to myself, I'm not going to shame myself into trying to action them because they're not a priority. So I want you to think about those things in your should bucket, you're just going to leave there, you're going to accept that they are not to be actioned. Anything in the should bucket is an automatic, it is not to be actioned. If you're going to action it, then move it into a different bucket. If you hold on to an I, I should, and it's both an I should, but also alongside that you feel like you should action it, but you know that you're really not going to, that is going to compound your suffering and your level of pressure. And coming out of COVID, that is the last thing that you need to do. And it can impact further on how you talk to yourself, or as Ariana Huffington says, how the annoying roommate in your head can talk to you. And uh, that, is, that is not helpful at all. So think about the shoulds. Think about what are the I wants, what are the I needs, what is left in the should bucket, and just allow them to be there, particularly as we come out of COVID. The sh these shoulds, the ones that are left, are the ones to notice and accept. There's nothing to be done about them now. And if you don't notice the should at first, you can be a should detective. Look for feelings of criticism about yourself or disgust or anger or upset, particularly when it comes to thinking about your journey forward out of lockdown. And if you're in a state where lockdown hasn't been so bad, you know what? It's still, this is a national industry that we're in and this has had ramifications for all of us. So if you feel this, this is a clue that there is a gap between the you that you are and the you that you would like to be around something. So this is the should gap. And when you identify what the something is, you've identified the should. So it might start with an inkling, as I say, of disgust or, or upset. And you can go looking for, well, where is the gap here between the version of reality that I would like, the version of myself that I would like, and the reality of where I am and identify the should. And then you might actually go looking further and break that should down into smaller pieces and think, well, this bit over here, I'm actually going to action. I wanna do something about this. And then alongside that, you can think, well, this bit over here, I'm just gonna notice it and I'm gonna let it be there. Now, I just wanna quickly get to self-compassion. So self-compassion, is really about three things. It involves three things. First, it requires noticing that there is a moment of suffering. So you might say to yourself, ouch, this hurts. You might notice that there's some feeling that is challenging, that is uncomfortable. In the case of shoulds, you might say, this should is painful. The second step, is leaning into our common experience rather than isolating yourself in your suffering. 
That is, the second step involves remembering that all humans suffer and that feelings of personal inadequacy are part of the shared human experience. So you might say to yourself, others too have shoulds. I'm not alone in this suffering. Other people feel this way. So this isn't about minimising your experience or normalising it away at all, but rather remembering that you're not alone and that you're not different. Unique, yes, but different in these universal experiences around suffering and shoulds, no. And the third step is to offer yourself an action and words that conjure self-kindness. So I'd like you to try something right now, and it might feel kind of kind of funny, but please just give it a give it a crack anyway. I'd like you to either place your hand over your chest, over your heart, and notice the rise and fall of your chest as you breathe, or just cup your hand, your head in your hand like so. And I'd like you just to bring attention back either to the feeling of your face in your hand or the feeling of the rise and fall of your chest under your hand. And you might ask yourself, what would a dear friend say to me that would help right now? Or you might like to say to yourself, may I be kind to myself? Maybe there's another phrase that speaks to you in your particular situation. May I learn to accept myself as I am? Or may I forgive myself? Or may I be accepting of what is whilst working towards a better tomorrow. So it's about identifying and then just being very compassionate towards yourself around any gaps between the should and what is and recognising that this should gap exists between the reality and what we would really like to see in our world. And that should gap that, recognize, that represents so much suffering, particularly at the moment, as we come out of COVID, it is real. And you know, one of the greatest things that we can actually do, and I know we're gonna get into specifics around mental health and wellbeing in, in just a minute, but one of the greatest predictors of mental wellbeing, as in positive mental wellbeing, for folks who work in the creative industries is connectedness connectedness with one another. So if we can actually get together with people who we trust and share our shoulds, it can be extraordinarily helpful and beneficial for our mental health and well-being. Because mental health and well-being, it's not just about symptom amelioration. We don't need to be afraid of our negative feelings and emotions. They're part of living but what we need to do is we need to get to a point where we start to really look inside and look around and say, how can we shift from a place of surviving to a place of, a place of surviving to a place of thriving, even in the midst of something so challenging to our industry? What does that look like? What can we use? And identifying the shoulds and connecting with one another around our shoulds, recognizing that we're not alone, whilst at the same time realizing that that process is not about normalizing, it's not about minimizing, it's about sharing our experience. Because as they say, there's nowhere uh, that can be more lonely than a big city. And the same is very much the, the case when it comes to our own experience and our concerns and how we feel coming out of COVID. But uh, I'd love to invite Richard back. Um, at this point so that we can broaden the conversation out and I can get more nitty gritty around your questions, maybe around uh, what you're experiencing, maybe around help with things like anxiety or performance anxiety even, um, or indeed how core values can help um, you as, as you come out of COVID, the idea of uh, identity, as well and how we're navigating that very curly issue. But over to you, Richard. Great, thank you, Greta. Look, perhaps just as a starting question to pick up on some of the things you were saying, you've talked about um, moving from surviving to thriving. How do we know when we're thriving, particularly when we've been isolated for so long? 
I really love what Martin Seligman sort of lays out in terms of, you know, thriving. So, you know what, I think thriving, because we know that negative emotions and, uh, you know, and challenging emotions are, are such a normal part of human existence. And our feelings are very much like the weather, you know, it's kind of like looking up at the sky and they can, they can shift and change. And it's really about noticing those emotions. So I'd say that thriving is not so much a necessarily a feeling of happiness, although it's certainly associated with having more positive emotions than negative emotions. And that's really the balance where, you know, I was talking about before, if you feel like negative emotions are crowding in on you such that it's kind of like your, your filters here and you've got, you're just kind of seeing the negative stuff and you're finding it really difficult to kind of broaden out and see the, the full, I suppose, palette of, um, of a life well-lived, whatever that means for you, then that's the time to seek help. So there's certainly more positive emotions alongside that, feeling like you have some moments in your life where you're meeting the world in flow, as Csikszentmihalyi, Csikszentmihalyi would say. So that idea of really having things that you feel engaged with, that you feel good about, alongside that relationships. So feeling like you can identify one or two relationships that feel really positive for you. Yes, relationships are messy and complicated, but on balance, they're positive. Alongside that, meaning and purpose, this idea that you have a sense of meaning and purpose in some areas of, of your life and you feel connected back to yourself through that purpose. So I'm not talking, you know, like purpose, saving the world purpose necessarily, but whatever that means for you. And then finally, and this is a big one, this idea of achievement. We tend to wait around to have these big moments of achievement. And that's when we celebrate and that's when we jump up and down, maybe, or maybe not even. <laughs> but what Martin Seligman would say is take some time to really hone in on the micro achievements, those small wins through the day. And at the moment, honestly, the small wins might be getting out for a walk or it might be just simply doing more than you did yesterday in terms of, you know, ticking off things on, on your list. So thriving can mean different things at different times for the one person and it can mean very different things for two different people depending on their aspirations, depending on their personality and what they, what they like. And it's less connected with happiness per se and more connected with a sense of fulfilment and a sense of alignment between who we are as, as a person and really what we want to be contributing towards and, and doing in our life. The other thing I would say on that, and I know this is a long answer, but, um, you know, eudaimonic happiness or happiness as we sort of perceive it as a feeling in our body we it sort of follows a normal distribution so you have you know kind of like average happiness which maybe a, a certain proportion of the population feels but then not everyone has the same level of happiness that they're going to sort of live with so me for instance I'm not a particularly happy person <laughs> it's a funny thing you know and it it actually was a very liberating thing to realize that I don't I don't need to be a very happy person to lead a fulfilling life. And actually, you know, that's, that's okay because I, I feel deeply. And, and so, you know, it, you might be someone who actually has less happiness per se in your life, but you can feel very fulfilled. Although I would say that probably if you're down the, like the, in the 10th, you know, the sort of bottom 10th percentile, um, similar to where I am, hey, we're together. But, um, you know, it might mean that we have to sort of cultivate more and be more intentional around cultivating good mental health and well-being but it's still it's still very possible a question from amanda pierce who asks what do you think some of the key in sorry what do you think are some of the key initiatives we should adopt to support our team members in returning to on-site work uh, and still maintaining some time at home that hybrid working model so uh, yeah the what are those key initiatives that we should adopt to support team members as we return to the office or that to the, the rehearsal yeah. room that is a fantastic question Do you know can i can i give you one reference which i think is just gold and that's priya parker so p r i y a 
and then Parker, P-A-R-K-E-R. PriyaParker.com is her website, but um, Priya has written a book called The Art of Gathering. And it's a fantastic book that, you know, for honestly, I would, I would say everyone read The Art of Gathering. It's fantastic. And there's, she also has a, uh, a version which is freely available on her website, at least it was the last time I checked. Um, and that is all about, you know, the, the sort of the hybrid model and the virtual model of gathering. So this is gathering, be it in the rehearsal room or a meeting room, whatever it might be, it's relevant. And, it, you know, these questions of truly what is the purpose of this, of this gathering and how are we coming together and how are we framing the uh, framing the meeting is it really relevant so there are those questions but alongside that to actually take a moment when we're coming back into gathering at work and saying so how are we doing today and you know a real I mean it seems like a really um, I suppose broad vague question but to allow space in the question for people to you know, provide their answers. And if this is a foreign kind of thing, then have the most senior person in that space share first. So this is not a time to get, you know, to, to feel like as particularly as the senior person, you need to get really super vulnerable and, and, you know, sort of put everything out there because this is a time just to create a space where everyone can feel like they can bring themselves and be really honest about how they're doing on that day. So it might be, okay, what do we need to share? So this is another question um, that I've heard that is really effective. What do we need to share or what do we need to mention that we're needing to park for this meeting in order to come back and be really productive? Another way in terms of team bonding, which has been really productive and a lot of um, folks have been using this, is this idea of using music and actually having different members of a group uh, suggest a piece of music and say, this piece of music takes me to this place. And this is a special memory for, for me of this place. And I'd like to share it with you. And this is just kind of like a way of, of bonding and a way of reflecting on this is a part of who I am and where I'm coming from and what is really meaningful to me. But I'd say alongside all of that, we don't have the same stamina that we did before this. Everyone, no matter where you are on sort of the introversion, extroversion kind of thing, and particularly for those who are, you know, outside of neurotypical, it's really important to, to remember that we need to habituate back into the work environment. And, um, and some people are really going to want to hold on to hybrid um, and, and others maybe want to return to a space more. And I think allowing as much flexibility around the return to work um, process as possible is, is really important. Just to pick up on, on that point, we had a question just come in from Heath Wilder who asks, um, as someone, uh, for those of us with a neurodiverse profile that may have found some relief from the, the stress of face-to-face -face work during lockdown, do you have any tips for creating, negotiating, retaining some of the mental health gains uh, people have discovered during lockdown? Yeah, that is a really, really good question. Um, full disclosure, I'm on the spectrum. So I'm with you and I, you know, it's, um, it has been a, a, a space which I think has given a lot of people even guilt <laughs> around, you know, really enjoying the, um, what, what COVID, the COVID context has brought to work in terms of working from home for, for a while. I would say really, Think about deeply what are the elements that have worked and what are the elements that uh, are around, I, I suppose, stimulation? What are the elements around connection? And then what are the elements around those shoulds and the pressure that we can put on ourselves that is bound up with the time that we spend around other people and the expectations that we put on ourselves? And then if you're in a position of, you know, being, I suppose, a, a leader or a, 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 I guess a boss in, you know, in, in one way or another within those contexts, really invite your people to 
come forward and, and say, you know, these are the things within the, the confines of what, what we need to be doing um, in the workplaces as we open up. These are the things that I really found helpful or enjoyable um, or both around the lockdown. So actually seek that feedback, not in terms of what do you, you know, what do you need moving forward? Because that has to be a negotiation, but what are the things that you found helpful from the, the working from home environment, if that makes sense, because it really does vary from one person or another. But I think to, to genuinely ask those questions without inadvertently finding yourself in a position of having, you know, a, a lot of different, I suppose, requests for different working environments, which might not be feasible moving forward. And I think there has to be a, an acknowledgement from everyone that, you know, it, it will be different as we open up as well. But I think really being, thinking for yourself around, well, what, what was really helpful for me and separating it out in terms of stimulation, relationships and, and the shoulds. Great, thanks Greta. Um, a question from a musician uh, has come to me, which is, uh, they were just after some advice about uh, going back to that first rehearsal after a long break, some advice around managing anxiety and also expectations. The fact that kind of uh, perhaps around self-blame, for example, oh, I'm not playing as well as I should or managing other people's expectations as well. But I think the anxiety side of the question uh, is a particularly kind of pertinent one for many people in the, in, uh, in the arts. Absolutely. So first, a, um, a resource, thehappinesstrap.com. If you head to thehappinesstrap.com, it's, uh, it started out as a book and now is this incredible movement, really. Um, there is a course that you can actually enrol in and pay for, but alongside that, there are a whole heap of free resources, which are fantastic. So this is based in acceptance and commitment therapy, and that's really where I want to take this conversation. So if you think about traditional cognitive behaviour therapy, which is a second wave cognitive behaviour role, therapy it was it tended and this is I suppose where my training started out the questions were tended to be around um, hey what is the veracity of this thought how true is this thought let's go looking for you know the evidence for and against this thought being true so this idea that you hook into a thought and you kind of break it down acceptance and commitment therapy kind of moves on from that and so instead of whether or not this thought is true it's whether or not this thought is true, how workable, how helpful is this thought for me? If this thought is not helpful for me, then what are some of the tools and strategies I can use to actually just allow that thought to be there? Because we cannot control our thoughts. And I want to, Richard, try this with, with you. Okay, for the next five seconds, do not think of a pink elephant. <laughs> Okay, that's quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so point being, we cannot control our thoughts. We absolutely can't. So those thoughts around, you know, oh my goodness, you know, how am I going to play? And there's veracity in these thoughts, you know, like they, they might, there might actually be something to them. I know for me, you know, I'm, I'm singing for the first time in a long time um, before Christmas and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you know, how's this going to go? And there's some truth, you know, in, in that, but whether or not, this thought is true. How helpful, how workable is it for me? Not very, like it's not because it's just going to be distracting. It's, you know, that those thoughts coming in and, and sort of uh, being like a filter. And, and then, of course, we go into looking for other information to, to sort of reinforce those negative thoughts. And that's when the fight and flight, so the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system can really kick into gear. We can have that threat response. And then we go looking for more evidence to support that worldview. So getting back to the happiness trap and getting back to acceptance and commitment therapy, this idea of allowing thoughts to be there as though they're maybe, it's a radio station that we let playing on in the background. We can't turn it off, that's impossible. Or it might be that those thoughts are like cars passing on the street outside and we can hear them. Um, Russ Harris has this great, and if you go to the happiness trap, um, this great example of thoughts being like sushi on a sushi train. And we can watch the sushi going past and we can choose which sushi to pick up and do something with. So this idea that 
We don't have to hook into the thoughts. We can just notice them and thank our mind for doing what it does best, which is trying to keep us safe and trying to prepare us. So these are, this is really important to bear in mind that what we're trying to do when we have these thoughts and when we have this anxiety around returning to the practice room or returning to the performance space or indeed the stage, our mind is trying to keep us safe and it's trying to prepare us. And so we, we need to be kind to ourselves in having those thoughts. It's normal and natural and we can't control our thoughts. But what we can do is we can do things that allow us to practice just noticing those thoughts, thank our mind, unhook and guide our attention to somewhere, somewhere else, another element of our experience. And this is where mindfulness practice really comes into play and also guided imagery as well. So this idea that if you, for instance, um, use an app like Smiling Mind, I really like Budify, that's spelled B-U-D-D-H-I-F-Y. So Budify is another great, um, great app. There's Insight Timer, which is terrific. Um, there's also uh, Headspace. So there are some, and, and then you've got others like um, Stop, Breathe and Think um, and, and even Calm. But those more active um, active apps that really help you practice mindfulness um, meditation. And can I just give you a tip here on mindfulness, right? Because a lot of people say, oh, I'm terrible at mindfulness. I can't do it. I tried it and it's just, you know, it's, oh, it's hideous. But the opportunity in mindfulness is actually guiding your attention back to where you intend it to be. That is the opportunity. So it's not a, oh, how good am I at right mindfulness because I'm going to maintain my focus right here. The point is to bring your attention back, to guide your attention back to where you intend it to be. And the gold is you can think of every time you do that as a rep of the, you know, of the attention muscle. You're working the attention muscle, metaphorically speaking. So you're guiding your attention back to where you intend it to be. And then if you pair that practice with this idea of I'm noticing that I'm having a thought about how bollocks I'm going to be when I next sing. Um, and I, is that thought helpful to me? Not really. Okay, so I'm just going to allow that thought to be there. I know that my mind's just trying to help me out. Thanks, mind. I'm noticing this thought. Thanks, mind. Unhook. I'm going to guide my attention to the sound of the cars swishing through the water outside. And I'm going to do that over and over for the next two minutes. I'm just going to keep on bringing my attention back. Every time I bring my attention back, that is an opportunity. And then you can take that practice into the rehearsal space or onto the stage even. And again, you're just, you, you have to have practiced. It isn't something that you can just magically do when you get into the rehearsal space. And the incredible thing is we're so neuroplastic that we literally can change our brains with mindfulness meditation it takes time but it can only take say six weeks so it's 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 remarkable how we can actually use mindfulness um, in in the context of coming back the other thing I would say is breathing look for breathing exercises and, and practice again it's no good just trying to do it when you're stepping into the performance space um, or into the um, into the rehearsal room but if you Look for a controlled breathing exercise that works for you and really practice using the breathing exercise to shift from the fight and flight to the rest and digest. So shift from the sympathetic nervous system activation over to the parasympathetic nervous system activation. It's all thanks to a bundle of nerves called the reticular formation. It's, it's very much a physical phenomena. Um, and it's just extraordinary the power of the breath and slow breathing to really shift us um, in, in, a, in a really um, powerful way. And the other thing I would say is we humans incline towards a state of homeostasis. So if we are feeling something in our body, we tend towards that, that state um, with our thoughts. We go looking for things to back up that way of I suppose, experiencing the world. So if we're feeling anxious in our body, 
we will automatically go looking for the tiger in the bushes. And we will filter for that information that creates a, a, a narrative to support how we're feeling. So similarly, if we're thinking about and, and worrying understandably about coming back and about what that might look, we tend to breathe more shallowly. We tend to actually activate the, the sympathetic nervous system. So activate that fight and flight response. So it can take a lot of intentionality around how we guide our attention, remembering that we can't control our thoughts. It's all about just gently guiding, guiding. Um, and alongside that, really thinking about how are we cultivating that sense of rest and digest in our, in our body through use of the breath, but also some really practical things. And this is where, you know, sleep really comes in, where alcohol as, as something that is both a stimulant and a depressant in the same, you know, but it has such a negative impact on sleep. It, it inhibits our ability to cycle through the four stages of sleep and get that really deep, refreshing REM sleep that we need, um, where things like that really, really come into play. Now, Greta, we're just about out of time, but I do want to squeeze in uh, uh, one last question, which is from a technician's perspective, um, uh, who mentions that uh, the sector has a very, the show must go on at all costs mindset, even in the best of times. Uh, and that's a mindset that could be switched into overdrive as we return to performance, return to the stages, which could cause burnout even more quickly than it, uh, is the case now. Any advice on being a calming, rational influence on the just get it done mob mentality oh that is such that is that's a really 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 good point okay so a couple again a couple of resources that I'd really like to um, uh, point you towards one would be self-compassion.org now I know you're probably thinking what you know how can self-compassion help in you know in in this but to really get back to basics around what we're experiencing here and, and how we can essentially be a barometer for the space that we are in. And to really reconnect as well with our values and why we're doing this and, and the priorities that we, that we really need to incline towards. And to have conversations and to share conversations around that purpose piece and what is necessary in this space. I think that looking after ourselves through this time is, is so important and being really intentional about basic practical things like sleep, like exercise, like what we eat as well is just so important because at the end of the day, there will be a great sense of pressure around the sector, around reopening and around um, how, we, how we rebuild. I think, I would also say that um, there's a great deal, and I know this is sort of a little bit off topic, but there's a great deal of interest at the moment around how the performing arts um, and, and how the creative industries can help the broader Australian community come out of lockdown, especially when it comes to mental health and wellbeing. So I think we need to remember that with this interest comes an imperative for leaders in our sector to remember that we have to lead by example and we have to ensure that irrespective of the pressures that we feel to reopen for the sake of the sector we have to put our people first and frankly we have to get better at putting our people first and cultivating a culture that really is people you know our people first and other things that you know the show and so forth sits behind that because otherwise we won't have a sector and you know I know that it's in this context it's one thing to say um, and really this you know this is like one hell of a big should in here really but the leaders out there in the sector really need to get behind this idea of we, we have to put our people first and the mental health and well-being of our people first for the sustainability um, so you know, a, a, a really, really good question. And I think it's going to turn into a burning platform if we're not careful um, 
yeah, I, I don't think I have anything more to say on that. Unfortunately, there are no no sort of silver bullets on, on the burnout front, except for prioritize your people and make sure they prioritize their mental health and well-being over and above the show. Great. Well, certainly something that uh, everybody in the sector will hopefully hear that message and act upon it as well, because as you say, Greta, it's a, it is a something that uh, it would be great to see more leadership on that front. Um, it's 21 minutes past. We were supposed to finish about five minutes ago. Are you okay with one more question, Greta? Yeah, totally. Great. Um, uh, what about advice to someone who is very good at burying negative thoughts or problems? Uh, burying negative thoughts or problems. So I, if I'm, if I'm hearing that right, and, um, and maybe that, you know, whoever um, put that question in, you can just correct me if I'm interpreting that the wrong way. But in, in what I'm hearing is burying negative thoughts or problems. Um, it sounds like there's a certain amount maybe of, um, of, of anger or upset there which is just not being acknowledged for the sake of getting on. Um, I would say a couple of things, and, and Richard, if you get further feedback around, if I'm interpreting that right, please just jump in and, and let me know. Um, a couple of things. One, find someone to talk to. It's so important. If you feel like you're burying negative thoughts or, or feelings, I can tell you, most probably what is happening is you're having a lot of conversations in your own mind about these things and they're becoming amplified, not past the point of, you know, their, their importance or anything like that. I'm not suggesting that they're less important that, than you feel that they are, but they will be crowding in on your experience of the world in really difficult ways. You need to find someone to talk to. Even if this is, for instance, the awesome individuals on the other end of the phone at the Wellbeing Support Act helpline who are trained not only their highly trained counsellors and psychologists but alongside that they're also trained in the industry to understand the pressures and to understand the context of what we're going through but finding people to talk to who can validate the way that you're feeling. And actually, Richard, going back to the, the question around what we can be doing as leaders and what we can be doing coming out of um, lockdown, one of the things that has really been missing through this time is incidental validation. So this idea of the validation of who we are over and above what we do, the sort of conversations that we might have in the kitchen or, you know, the kitchen of a, a venue or even, you know, for, for me as, a, um, as a, a, a woman, you know, standing at the sink in the bathroom, the sorts of conversations that you might have in the hallway that reinforce who you are and that you're a good person and that your, your issues are, are valid. But to find people to talk things through with is so important. Great. Greta, thank you so much, uh, not just for, uh, for the that answer but for all of your conversation and your time today we really appreciate you joining us apologies to those of uh those uh in the q a function that we couldn't get to everything but we thank you very much for your questions as well um uh, just a reminder that our next session in uh, the Recovery Roadmap webinars will be on Wednesday, the 24th of November. We'll be looking at issues around access and accessibility with Carolyn Bowditch, and we invite you to join us then. Uh, a video of this webinar and a transcript will be up on Arts Hub at the end of the week, and we'll also be sharing that with our friends at Creative Victoria, who of course are co-hosting and co-producing these webinars with us. Thank you to everybody uh, at Arts Hub who helped us put this together, and to the team at Creative Vic for their help as well. And again, Greta Bradman, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Richard.